Good evening. Good evening, everybody. I'm Dr. Patrick Lewis, the Director of Collections and Research here at the Filson Historical Society and the Filson's representative on the University Press of Kentucky Consortium Editorial Board. Thank you for joining us both in person and virtually for tonight's program. I'd like to take a moment to thank the sponsors of tonight's presentation, the Thomas D. Clark Foundation, the University Press of Kentucky, and the Association for Teaching Black History in Kentucky. We are so pleased to help host tonight's program alongside these outstanding organizations as we dig deeper into this vital area of the African-American history of the state. The Filson is one of Kentucky's oldest and is its largest privately funded historical society. With the mission of collecting, preserving, and sharing the significant history and culture of Kentucky and the Ohio Valley. In addition to our extensive research collections, we offer over 65 programs a year to the public, both locally and nationally. Many of these events feature UPK authors, including myself. In line with Kentucky Social Studies standards, we have also made key collections available digitally to schools, educators, and students. Our African American History Initiative, with current pledged funds in excess of $2 million, with a goal of raising more than three, will endow a permanent curator of African American collections and support positions, including funded internships to empower individuals and organizations to preserve and use their history to address community needs in the present. Together with tonight's sponsoring partners, the Filson will help ensure that Kentucky's African American history remains at the center of local memory, school curriculum, and public policy. Now, it is my honor to introduce Shaka Cummings, the Executive Director of the Association for Teaching Black History in Kentucky. Friends, good evening. My name is Shaka Cummings. And I have the privilege of serving the Association for Teaching Black History in Kentucky as the inaugural executive director. And what that means is that I get to do a lot of work, but I'm not afraid of a little bit of hard work. A little bit about me, I spent the better part of the last two decades as an educator. I've taught every grade level from pre-kindergarten all the way through seniors in high school. I've taught math, I've taught English, I've taught PE, I've been an assistant principal, I've been a principal, I've been an athletic director. If you ask me, Shaka, who are you? I'm a history teacher and I'm a football coach and I'm proud of both. Luckily in my role as the executive director for the Association for Teaching Black History in Kentucky, I get to leverage some of those core competencies that I was able to develop as a history teacher. The goal of the association is to make sure that the voices, the experiences of black Kentuckians are elevated that we give voice to those stories because those stories are incredibly important to the foundation of our great commonwealth. The association is the brainchild of several folks who are in the room, folks from the Thomas D. Clark Foundation. And as they were thinking about engagement in black history, they began putting out feelers and talking to different folks who wanted to engage in the work. And so the Thomas D. Clark Foundation is one of the governing members of the association along with Berea College, Kentucky State University, and the Muhammad Ali Center. As we engage in the work within the association, we have four strategies that we're using to really uh, guide us in the work that we hope to do. The first is to make sure that we're collaborating, collaborating effectively with educators across the state. And we broadly think about that term educator because I spent a lot of time in classrooms. Patrick is an educator who works in a community historical society, working in museums. We wanna partner with those folks as well. We have educators in our libraries. We have educators on college campuses. And frankly, because of the realities of COVID, we have a lot of folks who are doing a lot of homeschooling. We want to make sure that we're collaborating with all folks who consider themselves educators and ensuring that they are effectively teaching black history. We wanna create programming as well. We want to create programs to support educators in the work of teaching Black history. One of the pieces that we consistently hear is that folks feel like because of their experiences that maybe they're a little ill-equipped to potentially teach Black history effectively. And so we want to create the programming that would allow educators to feel like they have the support and the mechanisms to effectively teach Black history. 
We also want to make sure that we're curating resources, which is why it's so important to have a partner like the Thomas D. Clark Foundation with their connection with the University Press of Kentucky, because there's so many wonderful resources that are out there that if we can get those uh, resources in the hands of educators, they could use those to supplement the materials and the curriculum that they already have in their classrooms. So we want to make sure that we're curating resources. We also want to make sure that we're celebrating effective teaching of Black history, celebrating places like the Filson that are effectively putting together exhibits to really tell those stories of Black Kentuckians, celebrating uh, schools and teachers who are doing incredible work, celebrating and highlighting where effective Black history is being taught, and then holding up those examples as models that can be utilized in school districts across Kentucky. It's a lot of work, y'all, but I love it. Um, I'm so happy to be here, so happy to hear from Dr. Turley. There's a little Berea connection there. So very excited to hear what uh, the lecture today. I'm now going to turn things over to the chairman of the Thomas D. Clark Foundation, Benny Ivory, who will introduce our featured speaker. Oh boy, I'm not going to try to compete with uh, Shaka for titles tonight. I am a husband, father, grandfather, and retired newspaper editor. That's the best I can do. Uh, good evening and welcome. I'm Benny Ivory, chairman of the Thomas D. Clark Foundation. And I'd like to thank the Filson for allowing us to co-sponsor this evening's event. This is the second time we've partnered with the Filson. I hope it will not be the last. Uh, before I go on, I, I want to acknowledge civil rights icon in our audience tonight. At least I hope she's still here, Charlene Holloway. Charlene is, is a living legend. And if you don't know about her, you should find out about her because there, there's a lot of there's a lot of good to know about her. For those of you who aren't familiar with the Thomas D. Clark Foundation, it was created by the historian Thomas D. Clark. Uh, Dr. Clark was a man ahead of his time. He created the foundation for the sole purpose of supporting the University Press of Kentucky, which is a consortium press of all the states, public universities, and some private schools. Uh, UPK is vital to Kentucky because it publishes books that document the history of our state, books that otherwise might not be published. The Clark Foundation is unique, I think, because it does more than just meet and discuss books. We actually work. When a university press's funding was eliminated a few years ago, by the governor at the time, I won't mention his name, members of the Clark Foundation literally went to Frankfurt and successfully lobbied for restoration of that funding. For a re recovering journalist, that was traumatic. Most uncomfortable thing I've ever done in my life. The Clark Foundation also was a catalyst for the Black History Program that Shaka just talked about. That was three years in the making. So if you're interested, we're taking applications for membership tonight. Uh, yeah. this, this, is an, this is an organization that's important. And I think that has become as much as anything, a very, very much an activist organization. And I say that in a positive sense. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker tonight, Alistine Turley, the winner of uh, last year or this year's Medallion Award for the book, The Gospel of Freedom, Black Evangelicals in the Underground Railroad. The award is presented uh, to the author of a university press book that best exemplifies the high standards of Dr. Clark. Dr. Alistine Turley was born in Hazard, Kentucky, and currently resides on her grandparents' post-Civil War farm in Clay City, Kentucky, where her father, grandparents, and great-grandparents were residents. 
She currently serves as director of Freedom Stories for the International Storytelling Center in Jonesboro, Tennessee, where she recently completed production of the International Storytelling Center's 12-month Freedom Stories public discussion series. It includes creation of an online toolkit intended to keep Black Appalachian stories and resources alive and accessible for years to come throughout Appalachia. She is an honors graduate of Georgetown College, following which she earned a master's degree in public policy administration from Mississippi State University in Starkville. She has a master's degree in American history from the University of Kentucky, where she also completed her PhD in American history with a focus on the colonial to the progressive era with a minor in rural economic development. Since earning her PhD, Dr. Turley's academic work is focused on the role of free Blacks in American society, American reform movements, American and European abolitionism, which includes history of the Underground Railroad, American education reform, and rural economic development. In 2012, Dr. Turley founded the Carter G. Woodson Center for Interracial Education at Berea College, where she has also worked as an associate professor of African and African American studies until her retirement. In addition to serving as a member of the Kentucky African American Heritage Commission, she is also a member of the Kentucky Humanities Council Speakers Bureau, Board of Directors of the Kentucky Historical Society, and Board of Directors for the Kentucky African American Heritage Center. You've been busy. <laughs> With that, I give you Dr. Turley. Um, Dr. Turley, I'd like to present you with the Clark Foundation Medallion Award for your, your book. And I won't dare to try to open it because I would drop it. I'm going to open it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the box itself. Oh, it's beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> Wow. Things have changed a lot since I was teaching at U of L, and I'm now here in the beautiful addition to the Filson Club, where I spent many hours uh, researching. So I greatly want to thank Scott and the staff and administration here at the Filson Club, who are always so generous with their time and resources, helping me find materials. Um, it's just amazing the resource that this particular building and, and society has. So thank you so much. And you'll see in the book, Filson mentioned quite a bit <laughs> because the resources here, especially on the direct family, something that I would love to come back and do more research on when I, when I have time. But you haven't seen the last of me. I will be back. So having an opportunity to... Uh, talk about a book that was really a labor of love for me. It's uh, I was at an event over in Bowling Green this past week, and they asked me, how did I um, get started? What made me write this book? And what, and it's important for uh, Shaka to hear this because what caused me to write the book was my childhood experience in school. When, you know, at the end of the summer, when you come back and your teacher asks, what did you do over the summer? And I thought uh, this, I was beginning the fifth grade and I thought, well, I'm going to tell them a story, oral history story that has been in my family at generation after generation after generation. And it was a story of Moses Turley and his role as a conductor on the Underground Railroad. And I stood before the class and gave my best presentation of the oral history tradition that had been shared with me over the years. And as soon as I finished and uh, the teacher looked at me and said, well, you know, Alistine, that's a great story, but you realize it's something, it's not true. It's only something African-Americans told themselves to feel better about themselves. Yeah, that's how I felt. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's a long walk from the front of the classroom to your seat after you had made such a tremendous, you know, production of what you thought was an important story, only to find out that you're the only one who thought it was important. So that's when I realized that African American history is something that has not been well documented. Many of our stories have been shared through oral tradition. And when I first started in the academy, there was not a great deal of respect for the oral tradition. And, found, and so if it's not written, it didn't happen. So that's what was my impetus for making sure this story was written, number one, and number two, left breadcrumbs for anybody else who might want to pick up the mantle and continue the research, especially this story below the Mason-Dixon line. So I picked the song that we used to sing. How many people know this song, There Is a Balm in Gilead? You've heard it? This story came about by African-Americans in the 1790s, believe it or not when uh, Methodist minister John Wesley heard the song performed by African-Americans after he had delivered a sermon to them and they sang it to him from their slave quarter. And so I thought this was a very appropriate chapter title. It's chapter three in the book, but it's also a song we used to sing every Sunday in the choir at Mount Zion Baptist Church in Hazard. So many of the early songs that I've heard, I found out their connection to a bigger story. So we're gonna jump right into the story. When I was working for, I was in grad school and the summer before I went to grad school at Mississippi State University, I had an opportunity, uh, Bill Clinton uh, created, declared the national, the Underground Railroad a national story. But he said that anybody who, wanted to be a part of that national story, had it had to be well documented. And so we had to follow Department of Interior standards for documenting the story of the Underground Railroad. And I was fortunate enough to meet with David Morgan, who was then the director of the State Historic Preservation Office, who hired me as an intern before I went off to Mississippi State and said, uh, do you think you'd like to do this? And I'm like, would I? I'd love to do it. And so I began working with the National Park Service Department of Interior to document Underground Railroad stories in Kentucky. So by definition, the Park Service said that uh, they had to change the definition of the Underground Railroad. You'd be surprised how many people didn't quite understand when you said Underground Railroad exactly what people were talking about. So the National Park Service definition says it was effort, sometimes spontaneous, sometimes organized to assist persons held in bondage to escape slavery. The height of the Underground Road, according to the Park Service, is 1820 to 1865. But I have to tell you that African-Americans began escaping from slavery when their feet first hit American soil. So this is just a frame of reference. If you look at, uh, especially in Appalachia, which is the first land escape route, this is where you, how many people have ever heard of Melungeons? Oh, nice. I thought that's just over here in Eastern Kentucky. But this is where you get the Melungeons because a lot of these folks who escaped from the New England and East Coast of America, then England, actually made their homes in the mountains. And you stumble across them only after we start to come over the mountains to settle the West. So it's considered America's first interracial civil rights movement because it was a combination of Native American, African American, and European activists. I used, I put the word freedom location in parentheses because I don't want you to get the impression, uh, and this is what happens when you have a demarcation line like the Mason-Dixon line. Slavery was an American institution. Although we focus a lot on slavery in the South, slavery was everywhere in America. 
So slaves reaching the North and West continued to face hostility, even when they reached places of freedom, which is why you see so many locations in Canada. We talk about Canada. We don't talk much about Mexico, you know, with the outflow into Mexico. If you're living in Texas, it's much easier to go to Mexico than it is Canada. And if you're living in Florida, it's much easier to go to the Caribbean than it is Canada. So these escape routes, even though we focus a lot on Canada, they extended themselves throughout and to the West too, which were not states yet. There were still territories. When I first started studying the Underground Railroad, of course, Wilbur Siebert becomes the book that everyone references because he writes the first book about underground railroad escape routes in the United States. And he does this because he's a history professor and his students are bored. And he was trying to come up with a way to engage them in research. So he discovered that there were quite a few former underground railroad conductors and abolitionists who were residents of Ohio. So for his graduate, his students, he started giving them assignments of going out interviewing those people who had participated in Underground Railroad activity. And from those uh, interviews, he developed the map you see in front of you. So, oh, shucks. Okay, Scott, where's my pointer? <laughs> the middle? Thank you. Oh, nice. And so this is actually the map that started because if you know this here, or you tell me, what do you notice? They all, yeah, and Kentucky's nowhere in the story, right? All of the major routes, in fact, the, the actually Cincinnati that we talk about a lot, but actually the biggest route is right here out of Virginia into uh, Marietta, Ohio, which was the most heavily traveled route. And so I thought, well, that's interesting. How in the world did people reach freedom without coming through Kentucky? It's almost virtually impossible. But nowhere did I find any information that told me about an Underground Railroad connection in Kentucky. And, and Siebert is considered the authority on the subject. So I started just by reviewing his notes, people he had written about. And so one of the first things I discovered was many of the people that he referenced in his text were actually expelled Kentuckians who had been kicked out of the state for their anti-slavery views and simply went across into free territories and established outposts. So when I did uh, the national stories and locations, this is something the Park Service wanted. I ended up going all over the country, talking to various people, including Hillary Clinton, who was that time the Senator. And she was in New York to um, dedicate Ellis Island, but to also recognize and pay back wages to the Moses of the Underground Railroad, Harriet Tubman who had worked as a spy and a, a nurse and a conductor and a, uh, all these things for the Union Army, but had never been paid. And so Hillary Clinton wrote legislation that paid Harriet Tubman's money. She should have tacked a little interest on there, but that didn't happen. So the money went to the Tubman Foundation and the Tubman Home, which is in upstate New York. So uncovering these national and international personalities that were associated with telling a, a story. So the extensive archival research, some of it done right here at the Filson, the idea was to explore people who were involved in telling the story, uh, try to determine the escape, uh, escape routes that had been developed by these operators, find out if there were any remaining descendants who had been connected to these stories, document important events, publicized incidents, which newspapers often had a great deal of information, ge uh, identify geographic areas and features that needed to be examined. And this is, how many people know William Still? One of the best known Pennsylvania conductors on the Underground Railroad, he also wrote a book 
on the Underground Railroad. He was forced to burn a great deal of his material when people came um, looking for him because he had been such a big part in helping African Americans escape. But this is his grandson that I had the opportunity to meet in upstate New York, William Still, named for his ancestor. This is the route, the escape route that the Park Service developed. And this is a little bit more accurate account of where people were escaping to on the Underground Railroad. Uh, again, I felt they only picked one location in Kentucky. I thought, ah, uh, still not feeling this feeling that Kentucky wasn't much. They have something that goes up the, the river, the Ohio River, out of the Mississippi River, and then out of, I'm not quite sure where that's supposed to be <laughs> in Kentucky. But again, I felt like Kentucky had been once again overlooked. So the NPS findings officially established three major escape corridors. The first was the considered the Eastern Corridor, which was the Atlantic Ocean. The second is the Central Corridor, which they call the Appalachian Trail, which actually the trail goes from uh, Georgia all the way into Nova Scotia, right? And then the Western Corridor, which was along the Ohio and Mississippi rivers, primarily into Indian Territory, Mexico, and other Western territories. So based on these routes they came up with because there's a great deal of documentation that you can find that supports stories and conductors. So they felt fairly comfortable. And Kentucky again showed up in these stories but still weren't well documented. So the Underground Railroad system about 1820s are when trains are becoming popular in the country. And so the uh, abolitionist Quakers get a lot because Quakers had to use coded language in their meetings. And so it was easy for them to adapt uh, their code system to what they saw happening for African-Americans who were attempting to escape. So agents or ticket sellers were those advocates who provided information. So maybe you're not someone who's gonna conduct, but I can certainly tell you where to go, what to do. For a long time, I think John Greg Fee was a ticket agent. He may have also been a conductor, but I, I found his family in Claremont County, uh, Ohio, who actually were conductors. But I think John Greg Fee, the founder of Berea College was actually a ticket agent. A station master was someone who housed and protected slaves, moving them along the slave routes and to the next safe location. So station masters knew, everybody had a very small group of folks. They, nobody knew the entire system, if that makes sense. Because it's very likely you could be arrested and tortured into telling something, but if you don't know anything, what can they do to you? except, well, they can do a lot to you, but they won't get any information. And so conductors were those who actually traveled in the slave territory to rescue, assist, or facilitate slave escapes. Most of the conductors were African-Americans. Why do you think that was the case? They're in the Southern society. This is their society. It's easy for them to move about on plantations. They don't create a lot of attention. Uh, they probably know who can be trusted, who can't. So for the most part, those who actually went into the South to bring slaves out were African-Americans. So coded language, signs and symbols, and coded music were some of the ways that they communicated. The impetus for running away was often fear of sail south. The life expectancy, well, first of all, Kentucky had one of the longest life expectancies for enslaved African-Americans. Enslaved Africans in Kentucky probably lived to be at least in their 60s or 70s. When you are sold to a sugarcane plantation in Louisiana or a cotton plantation in Alabama, Mississippi, or Georgia, your life expectancy of an enslaved person was seven years. 
seven years from the point of purchase until their death because they were worked continuously. And now that they're doing DNA and um, other studies, they find bones that had literally been worn away from repetitious work. And so many ran away to attempt to find family members. Many ran away for fear of punishment. This image you see of Gordon, which uh, they finally found out his real name. He was from the Lions Plantation in Louisiana. Uh, he, was, he ran away, but you can see the severity of his punishment. He's been whipped more than once. And in just about every courthouse, there was someone who was tasked with the responsibility of whipping slaves. You actually paid somebody to do this. If the slave owner wasn't willing to do it himself, or if the slave owner was in another state and felt this slave needed to be punished, anywhere from 30 to 100 lashes, if you can imagine. I've had students, uh, when I was teaching, 30 lashes, ah, and I asked them to tap the table. If your teacher has asked them to tap the table 30 times and imagine getting that many with a bullwhip, I don't know how anybody would tolerate 100 lashes. Modes of travel, by any means necessary. So there was no standard way of escape. People escaped on foot, horseback, riverboats, trains, false bottom wagons, which Pennsylvania, the William Steele family had, they still have their false wagon, bottom wagon as part of their uh, family collections. Most slave escapes were below the Mason-Dixon line were self-reliant and locally resourced. So you got to a certain point on your escape before you could actually receive aid. Kentucky is known for women that look like this. They were called fancy girls. Uh, they were sold in the Louisiana slave markets and purchased primarily from Kentucky slave markets, especially in Western Kentucky here in Louisville that act, had a very active fancy girl market. And for fancy girls, how much do you think they would sell for? The average slave was between $300 and $500, depending on their skill set. And Kentucky slaves were very much valued in the South because they had skills. They were either tinsmiths, silversmiths, blacksmiths. They had all fabric makers. Fancy girls, which were often sold to Southern brothels or uh, made, placed in plissage. Plissage means that um, the planter would have a home, say, here in Kentucky, but also a home in New Orleans. And the his, this fancy girl would be his wife in New Orleans. And so those positions were normally negotiated. And a fancy girl, roughly at a slave market, is about $3,500. So what is that in 1840 money? I think you times that times seven, I think is the ratio. And that gives you an idea. One fancy girl purchased in a Kentucky slave market. This is what slavery looked like at the United, in the United States just before the Civil War. Uh, you can see this, this is the Appalachian Trail. This means when I grew up, I was told there were no black people in Appalachia. So imagine my shock to find out, wow, we were there in large numbers, mainly because in Appalachia, what's happening? Anybody know anything about Eastern Kentucky? Well, coal is the last product, but one of the first things that's found in Appalachia are salt. You know, if you drive, you see salt licks, the true salt mines. <laughs> are in um, Appalachia. Then you have iron ore, then coal. And all of these things required intensive labor. So many Appalachians, although they may not have had large numbers of slaves in their homes, this is the place where slave leasing happened. So you could be living over on the river in Louisville and actually lease your slave to a salt mine or coal mine or some or a, a, a train, someone that's clearing the forest for tracks. It was very profitable and you didn't have the burden of um, 
caring or feeding because that was handled in the contract of the person you leased to. And one of the first things I found when I came to Louisville, I think it might have even been here at the Filson, was insurance papers from Aetna Insurance of the slaves that were insured in these lease arrangements. It's like a, they kind of spell out the guidelines of the lease. This is uh, the, the shaded area you're looking at. This is the Appalachian Trail. You see it ends up here in Nova Scotia. So major escape quarters I mentioned were West Virginia into Marietta, Ohio, which is the Kanawha River Valley. And it's, it's probably the most industrial area of Appalachia even today. And it increased the number of enslaved African Americans in the region, as well as the number of orchestrated slave escapes, because you're right across the river. If you are, you can look and see freedom. So Reverend Samuel Doak, this is one of the things I discovered when I began working at the International Storytelling Center. Samuel Doak is from Jonesboro, Tennessee, which is where the International Storytelling Center is located. He is a he was a Princeton graduate, a Presbyterian minister. A, he was a former slave owner, and he became an anti-slavery advocate and teacher. Uh, he, and he was in uh, Sullivan. His family su settled in Sullivan County, Tennessee. He freed his slaves. Founded Washington College, and he's the founder of Cumberland Presbyterians. How many people have ever even heard of Cumberland Presbyterians? Thank you. I, I asked someone the other day and they said, what? It's this gentleman who founded the Cumberland Presbyterians, which was an anti-slavery emancipationist uh, church or organization. And his idea was uh, Presbyterians believe very strongly in education. They felt that if you could educate people, then slavery would end once people were aware of the problems with it and how wrong it was. So um, the Cumberland and Presbyterians, oh, he's also founder of Tusculum University, but he sent missionaries, evangelicals from Tennessee to Southern border between Tennessee and Kentucky. And so most of the Presbyterian churches that were on that border were anti-slavery Presbyterian abolitionists who established several churches, which I talk about in the book. And we're not, we're not going to run through all of them here. But he certainly sent these people out with the idea of spreading education and anti-slavery. Another uh, East Tennessee abolitionist was Elihu Embry, which there's no photographs of. He would not allow himself to be painted. There are no known images of him. He was a son of a Philadelphia Quaker who was quite wealthy in the iron industry. He and his brother Elijah worked in East Tennessee as iron manufacturers. They had slaves that mined iron ore. And he reportedly freed his slaves in 1812 after he became convicted it was wrong. And established the, uh, Tennessee's first anti-slavery newspaper and the um, East Tennessee Manumission Society, which had over 400 members. And that membership became responsible for advocating anti-slavery in Tennessee, as well as conducting people on the Underground Railroad. Benjamin Lunday, a Quaker, a saddler and a newspaper publisher as well. He went on the circuit preaching. His home, by the way, in Ohio is in complete shambles. And I've been trying to reach out to the Ohio Preservation Society to ask them to do something. This, that's his home. It's, it's, it's still there. There's a marker, but no one has done anything to preserve the home. But he's the founder of an anti-slavery society in St. Clairville, Ohio. He became a conductor, one of the few white conductors who would actually go into the South and bring slaves to freedom in Ohio. He established a community in Canada that's still there called Wilberforce. And of course, everybody knows this guy. 
And, you know, when I was a kid, I thought he was black. People actually told me he was black and I believed them. But uh, John Brown, who was born, his father was an anti-slavery advocate. He was born in Akron, Ohio. He was all things, abolitionist, agent, conductor, station master. Uh, he was educated by Elysia Wright in Talmadge, Ohio. And as a tanner and merchant, he actually supplied funds to those people who were working to help slaves escape. And of course, we all know about Bleeding Kansas and Har his raid on Harper's Ferry. But he's an Appalachian conductor. This is a copy, uh, a friend of mine who's now deceased, Henry Burke, who did a great deal of research on the escape path out of Appalachia into the Ohio uh, River Valley and Marietta, Ohio. And he's responsible for this marker that's right there at the Ohio River in Marietta. But he composed this map to show you the places, the, the actual escape path once people left Kentucky. This is one that he most heavily researched, which had a great deal of um, Quaker influence as well as African-American influence to reach. Uh, most people didn't stay in Ohio. They kept going north to Canada because what's happening? 1854, you have fugitive slave law. Noted Marietta, this family, I just began to be in touch with the Putnam family. James Davis, who was the first child actually born in the Northwest Territory. He was an African-American who went on to become a conductor. David Putnam Jr., whose house they just tore down, was an Underground Railroad safe house. And poet Frances Dana Gage, who during the Civil War, she was a conductor, but she also established the schools in South Carolina. Uh, she became a... Um, worker with the Union Army to educate uh, freed slaves. Once they reached uh, her school, she had over 600 students that she educated. One of my favorite people, ladies, would you follow him? I think I would have. <laughs> he, uh, John Jones, John W. Jones, who was born, he escaped slavery from Leesburg, Virginia. He was the sec became the sextant of First Baptist Church in Elmira, New York, which, by the way, was a, a large uh, underground railroad location. They're, they've got quite a few well documented sites, and he conductor. He worked with Harriet Tubman and shepherded slaves from the South to Harriet Tubman's St. Catherine Canada settlement, and that settlement of hers is still in Canada. But he would actually be one of those who would go into the South and bring slaves into upstate New York. And of course, this person, Levi and Catherine Coffin, how many have been to this home over in Indiana? Uh, he actually left Greensboro, North Carolina, uh, North Carolina with a whole a community of Quakers that actually moved to Indiana to set up Underground Railroad Assistance. And he named himself president of the Underground Railroad. That's pretty bold. And then, uh, set up places in Fountain City, Indiana, and of course, Cincinnati, Ohio, where he helped slaves. He, again, would fund a lot of escape from Southern states. He's one of the few people he did. He was a, a ticket agent who actually would go to Southern slaveholding locations. And um, you've heard the theory, all eyes on me. He would have a public meeting where he would give these long sermons about anti-slavery. And while he was talking to this irate Southern public, all of his agents would be helping slaves escape. So Kentucky, a few Kentucky Underground Railroad operators that we've been able to successfully document. These are the escape routes. This is also in the book. How it's great when you are a college professor and you have students who have to do what you say. And so one of the things that I had my students do for a course I taught every other semester was we collected all the Kentucky newspapers and they had to go through and document escape ads. And in the escape ads contain quite a bit of information. And from those, I think 650 escape ads, we came up with these 13 exit points. 
throughout the state. Escape ads will say where the slave escaped from, where the owner thought they were going, uh, a description. It will tell you what their skill sets are. It will even tell you their value if captured. These are examples of some of the ads that the students uh, clipped. I have a box full of these. I'm trying to decide what to do with. I can't get rid of them. But it's 18, they went through all the early newspapers and you can see the types of information, including the names of the owners, you know, that, that are looking for these, these escaped slaves. Uncle Tom's Cabin. Everybody knows that story, right? How many people have actually read the book? Very good. These are all Kentucky stories. She actually came to Maysville, Kentucky and stayed with a family in Maysville and interviewed people in the book. If you get the book Keys to Uncle Tom's Cabin, how many people know about that book? It actually tells you who the people are that she interviewed. So uh, she, as a young woman, spent time in Maysville where she saw her first slave auction. And from there, her um, brothers and her father, of course, were teachers uh, at uh, Lyman in Ohio. They were teachers in Ohio University. And she began to write about these stories and collect stories. This was, she became America's first millionaire, first female millionaire from Uncle Tom's Cabin, which was produced, turned into plays. She sold so many editions of her book, not only in the United States, but in Europe. And so Lincoln, because of her popularity and the fact that so many people knew her book, Abraham Lincoln titled her The Little Lady That Started the Civil War. Reverend David Barrow, he was a 1790s Kentucky settler. He came from Brunswick County, Virginia. Re, uh, he had preached in Virginia, North Carolina, mainly trying to get away from the issue of slavery. He corresponded with Thomas Jefferson about the evils of slavery. There's His letters are um, in the Historical Society in Mount Sterling. But he established anti-slavery churches both in Mount Sterling uh, in, in Clark County. He's the founder of Kentucky's first anti-slavery society, the Baptized Licking Locust Friends of Humanity. That's a mouthful. He was Baptist, but many of the members in his anti-slavery society were Quakers. So the Friends uh, is a nod to the Quakers who were part of it. And this headstone, which I just, it's terrible that it's in this shape but it's about 11 miles from my house where I live now. And we found, we walked through this uh, very barren uh, place. And right now it's the only headstone. So that's where he is buried in Mount Sterling. Reverend Carter Tarrant was born in Virginia. He worked with David Barrow as a young minister. And he established anti-slavery churches in Tennessee, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Ohio, Indiana, and Louisiana, and pastored uh, then the Emancipationist Hillsboro and Clear Creek Baptist churches in Woodford County. He died in New Orleans. He was on his way to serve as chaplain to Black volunteers during the War of 1812. So he never uh, reached his mission, but I'm happy to see that uh, Clear Fork Baptist Church recognizes him and his efforts. Jo Josiah Dodge, another member of in this part of the state, the Salem Association of Baptists. He was the pastor of Servants Valley Baptist Church in Hardin County. And uh, he was kicked out of Rolling Fork Baptist Church in Boston, Kentucky, <laughs> which I drove through on my way here. Excuse me. He actually ended up in Southern Ohio, where he established a whole chain of <clears throat> churches along the river that still exists today. How many people have been to this man's house? 
<clears throat> he is in Ripley, Ohio, but he was actually kicked out of Kentucky. He, he uh, <clears throat> is from East Tennessee. He was educated by Doak at Washington College, and he was ordained by Doak into the Presbyterian ministry. He established churches, anti-slavery churches in Carlisle and Maysville, Kentucky, while a resident. And in 1822, when his churches were being threatened, because with each church, he had a school for African-Americans. And the thing that really irritated these communities was the fact that he was openly educating enslaved African-Americans. So he was chased out of um, Maysville with club and, and torches and actually rode across the river to Ripley and establish this home, which sits at, it, it's a tiny looking house. It sits at the very top of the hill. You can, if you're on the Kentucky side, you can actually see this house. And what he would do in those two windows in the front, he would always have a candle lit at night. So if you were on the Kentucky side of the river, you know, you had the direction to walk toward. And this is the story of Eliza. How many know that story? This is the house that she escaped to. Henry Bibb, Henry Walton Bibb, escaped from Trimble County, Kentucky, Baptist minister, Canadian newspaper editor. He, he established Canada's first African-American newspaper. He was also a land developer. His church, Sandwich Baptist Church, is still in Emmitsburg, uh, Canada, and he is responsible for housing over 600 escaped slaves. Uh, he dies, he dies before the actual real uh, push, but he begins when he escapes slavery and moves on to, to uh, Canada. He never gives up the idea of help finding a place uh, outside the United States for enslaved African Americans. His father is white. His uh, he gets many chances to escape because he's trying to get back and find his family. But the last time he escapes, he just gave up on his family and decided he needed to start a new life in Canada. This is his church. And there is an actual tunnel in this church that uh, you can, the last pew in the church slides back. And under that pew, there's a trap door that I forget the song. There's a certain song, if the choir began to sing it, that let the congregation know that slave hunters were in the, in the congregation. And so uh, I've been down in that tunnel. So it's still there and I appreciate them keeping it. Josiah Henson, Uncle Tom. In Harriet Beecher Stowe's book. And the first thing the family said to me when I met them was, please don't call him Uncle Tom. <laughs> His name was Josiah Henson. Uh, he established, he was a, he became a Canadian British Methodist Episcopalian minister. He escaped slavery with 30 others from Davies County. Uh, who he had unsupervised. He took these 30 souls, uh, 18 souls into slavery in Davies County before he realized what he was doing. He stopped actually in Cincinnati and they tried to tell him, don't do it. But because he had given his word to his owner, he did. But then in the end, he realized when he couldn't purchase his freedom, that the only way he would receive it would be to escape. So he became the founder of Don Settlement, which is now a Canadian national landmark in Dresden, Ontario, Canada, and is responsible for aiding over 20,000 slaves escape from America. This is when I was teaching. These are my students. This is his church. One of my students standing in the doorway. It's a Methodist Episcopal church. These are some of the, these are in the museum. These are some of the utensils that he was he took off of some of the escaping slaves once he was able to get them where he could remove these are these chains. Anybody know what this is right here? If you had a slave who refused to eat, 
they would put this down their throat to open their mouth and force feed them. And you cannot pick, I don't know how somebody escaped with this. It's extremely heavy, but someone did. Reverend Elisha W. Green, who was born in Bourbon County, Kentucky, uh, sold into Mason County slave owners. Who, uh, he purchased his freedom along with some friends in uh, Maysville who worked with him. And he became pastor of Maysville First Baptist Church. He was the founder of the General Association of Kentucky Baptists, which is, I think, still exists today, if I'm not mistaken. They were the founders of Simmons University. And he is the founder of the Black Baptist Churches in Mason, Fleming, Bourbon, and Fayette Counties. And he's also the founder of Kentucky Normal and Theological Institute, Simmons. Uh, there is no, if you read, uh, if you read his narrative, because he did, he's one of the few African Americans who wrote a narrative. The thing, if you read it, you have to pay attention to what he doesn't say. He gives you a great deal of detail but there are several things he doesn't say. For instance, how his daughter ends up in an Underground Railroad location in Portsmouth, Ohio. It's just he skips to that story. True investigative work. But he tells you a lot in that little short narrative. And of course, John Greg Fee, who I think was more an agent than a conductor, born for a slave, to a slaveholding family in Bracken County, He's a Presbyterian minister. He is the chaplain to the United States Colored Troops at Camp Nelson. He founds Berea College. But one of the things I discovered when I wrote the book was that he had aunts and uncles in Claremont County, Ohio, who were known Underground Railroad conductors. And they actually have a town in Claremont uh, that's Fee, Fee family, who were actively engaged in Underground Railroad activity more to be done on him. This is a friend of John Greg Fee, Arnold Gragston, who uh, was enslaved on the Jack Tab Plantation. He's uh, credited with at least 480 slave escapes. This is the gentleman you wanted to know because he rode you across the river. You know, once, <laughs> once you got to the river, then what, right? You needed to have someone, and I'm sure he wasn't the only one, but he's the one that left a narrative behind and he enlisted, he came, he actually, uh, when they suspected that he was the one that was rowing people across the river, he fled to join other escaped slaves in Detroit, but came back to enlist at Camp Nelson once the Civil War began. This gentleman, Lewis Hayden, we talk a lot about this, I call him our Southern Frederick Douglass. He is an escaped slave from Lexington, Kentucky. He was, he's the founder of um, several churches, both in Detroit, Methodist, he was Methodist, Michigan and um, Boston. He was the American Anti-Slavery Society speaker, station master, army recruiter. If you watch uh, Glory and they show you Frederick Douglass, but it's actually this man, who was actively uh, recruiting. He went to governor, uh, governor of Massachusetts and got the governor to talk to Lincoln to establish the Massachusetts 54. And so he's becomes uh, Massachusetts first black elected legislator. His home is now a uh, national treasure in Boston. Served in the Boston, Massachusetts House of Representatives, Boston, uh, our Massachusetts House of Representatives, sorry. And this is who I stood up in class and spoke about uh, to my great embarrassment. <laughs> but this is Moses Turley, who was born, uh, we think, in Virginia. And at the time of his escape, he was clearing land in Virginia where he saw the slave owner or whoever was tasked with the slaves that day beating a woman and he severely beat the person who was administering the punishment, thought he had killed him and therefore ran. And he ended up in Aaron's Run, Montgomery County, Kentucky, where he was met and helped by uh, James Turley, which is where our Turley name comes from. 
James Turley was an Indian negotiator. He was also a county sheriff, a general store owner who specialized in blackberry wine, <laughs> which, oh, by the way, Moses was a great blackberry wine maker. And he became a conductor along the Licking Locust and other Eastern Kentucky rivers to Canada. He was he enlisted in the United States Colored Troop Heavy Artillery at Camp Nelson at the after the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation. Now, this is the information since the book came out. This is a great thing, Ashley. Thank you. <laughs> that people came forward with this uh, tintype. It's a pocket tintype, which I had never seen one before. But she said, this is Susan. So this is Moses's wife. I don't know, can you guys really see her? She escaped from slavery somewhere south. And uh, she married, Moses met her, we think. I haven't been able to really track down how they met, but I think think based on the time frame that he was probably with one of uh, a USCT unit and he escorted her to live with, to Mount Sterling where she uh, stayed until they married. And they had three sons th together. John and Joseph were two children that she had when Moses met her, their uh, mixed race. And Grant, Richard, who is my grandfather, and Noah, they had as a couple, Moses and Susan. And then no, um, I'm not sure if Georgiana and Louisa were Moses's children or siblings. We're still trying to nail that down. But this is what happens when people, um, when you start telling a story and people bring you information. I don't, I haven't been keeping time, Scott. I hope you have. Am I, okay. So you never know where you're going to find information. But once, and the purpose of the book, at least I hope if you have it and you read it, you'll find that I've tried to leave you or any researcher some breadcrumbs that they can follow to tell a more comprehensive story below the Mason-Dixon line, especially when it comes to African-Americans, because those oral history traditions need to be recorded. And I have to thank the teacher who made me take that long walk back to my seat, because if she hadn't done it, who knows? I may not have been so determined to prove her wrong. And I wouldn't have this book. So I have long since let go of my anger. And I've actually gotten to the point where I think, well, thank you for sending me down this research path that resulted in the publication of this book. That's my next presentation. Somebody mentioned quilts. I'll be over in Paducah talking about the quilt code. So that's it for me. Well, what an absolutely incredible presentation. Thank you, Dr. Turley. If anybody does have questions, like I say, we have uh, mics on either side here, please uh, come on down here. Yes. Uh, just real quick, Dr. Turley, if you're serious about making sure that you have a place to put those um, the slave announcements from the newspapers, I know an association that might take those on, digitize those and make sure that they're resources for educators, so we can talk a little bit more. All right. Thank you. Yeah, after all that hard work I made my students do, they should go somewhere. <laughs> more papers. I only had 650. I'm sure they're more than that. Yes. Uh, Dr. Turley, if you can, please make explicit for this audience why it's so important to the governor of Florida to make it impossible for young people, not just Blacks, but all young people to learn this history. I think it's important to make that explicit connection rather than assume that people see the connection between that. Thank you. Is that a clear question? Yes, yeah, so. and usually I begin, I begin by saying this history is under assault. You know, once you get to the point where, first of all, it took so long for us to even 
be able to examine our history and to make it a valid discipline of study. Now, because it is so popular and because it's making you take a different look at what has been promoted as American history, now we don't want to hear it. That's basically what's being said, is we have a, an image of America that we like. We don't want to hear these stories about Native Americans or African Americans or even women, for that matter. We want you to stick to the script, right? And so this is why education is now under assault. But the thing is, kids are much smarter now. They're not going for the okie doke. <laughs> they have internet. They have African-American friends. They know that something is missing. And we cannot stop providing them details. And yes, it does challenge the narrative. I agree. It needs to be challenged. There's so much that is not true. I was speaking to someone at the book festival last week about my old Kentucky home. How many people know that story? How many people believe that story? That is such a fabricated piece of mess. You know, it's like Stephen Foster never at Bardstown, never set foot in the place. My old Kentucky home, it, it's so many pieces. I, you can pull that apart. So anyone who has an academic mindset, if you fought, but I understand the economic dollars attached to that story. And that's what makes it difficult to change. And I say that's true for most things so that we've built the nation on these lies. And so trying to change the story is gonna be extremely difficult. Good question, but it needs to be done. Banning books, do I, we, who does that? <laughs> Teach better. Yes. Where is uh, Moses Turley buried? He is buried in Pine Grove Cemetery next to Susan. It's our family cemetery on Turley Road, where I live. And is it well cared, well cared for? Yes, it is very well cared for. And we take uh, whenever we have, we will be celebrating our 159th family reunion, August 12th of this year. And we always take our the kids, the younger kids, and show where Moses and Susan and their children are buried. And we tell this story. This story, I know it only because my grandmother told me, and then when she died, my uncles told me, and then when they died, my father told me. That's the way I know the story. So um, the cemetery has, it was built to go along with the Methodist church that was established in 1854. And the church had a school on, that, on our road. It was then Lulby Grud Road where Daniel Boone first uh, settled when he came into Kentucky. That's where we're located, right on Lullaby Grud Creek. So that's the cemetery is there. No questions. Come I on. thought it was, it was really uh, important when you showed those pictures of, of your students uh, going up to Canada and talking about your students getting involved in the research and identifying those routes up through Kentucky and those those uh, those access points to freedom. Can you talk about the students' experience and what they took from being at these sites or participating in that research and why that's important for them to experience? Thank you. That's a good question. Um, when I was teaching at uh, Georgetown College and also at Berea College, one of the things I learned as a history professor, like Wilbur Siebert, students remember and retain what they experience. And so rather than just read this material, of course you have to have extensive reading and you have to you know, have, have facts that they need to memorize. But more than that, they need to see themselves in the story. 
that history is not separate from who they are. And so by actually having them read some slave narratives so that they could become acquainted with some of the names, then actually be able to take them to the locations where these events happened was extremely powerful. I still have students today who call me and they recount to me their trip. And they tell me, uh, we actually went, I've taken students on Underground Railroad tours from Kentucky to Canada, from Kentucky to Trinidad, from Kentucky to the Caribbean, the Virgin Islands. And we've actually gone to places. We've gone to sugar plantations. We have uh, asked them to participate in actually cutting sugar cane. Has anybody ever cut sugar cane? Has anyone ever picked cotton? What did you think about picking cotton? It's painful, isn't it? Very painful because cotton has those thorns. Yeah, and you stick your hand in there to pull out a cotton ball, you're gonna cut up your hands. Yes. Mm -hmm. And just kick them out of the bus and say, hey, I'll come back in an hour. I want this row of cotton pit. It's an entirely different mindset. They they wouldn't survive if 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 students had to experience what these slaves because several students would say, well, I never would have been a slave. You know, that was their comment to me. I, why did they stay? Why didn't they just run away? And so you you drop them off in the Mississippi Delta and say, okay, go. Where are you going? <laughs> so, so a dose of reality, I think, is what experiential travel and education does for a student. It, it changes their perspective very quickly where they uh, can see themselves experiencing some of these things. Yes. I don't know that I have so much a question as I have a thank you. So Presbyterian who leads a Catholic school, who went to divinity school at Harvard. So I'm a victim of my education. This was an amazing book. And um, I was introduced to Howard Thurman in divinity school who talks about um, Christianity being a great faith for the oppressed and a terrible faith for those who are the oppressors. Right. And I wanna thank you for creating a huge gap for me between white evangelical Christianity and black evangelical Christianity. And I wanna give you a chance to maybe talk about that because oh, wow. for me, me, me it was like, wow, I, I missed that one. Thank you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um. Let's see how to approach this because I have several ministers in my family. But um, the idea of teaching the enslaved to read was a British concept because not for the purpose of introducing freedom, but for the purpose of making them better slaves. It was felt that um, I think I talk about uh, the tavern in Virginia where Vogue, who uh, let her, well, I don't know so much as she let him, but he learned how to read and write and then brought several other people along and they began to have these secret prayer meetings where he was teaching. He became a teacher. And there was never in the British concept that by teaching a slave to read and write, that was going to automatically result and freedom seeking. But that, and so during the first great awakening, it was all about the British coming to America saying, you know, you really should treat your slaves better. You should expose them to the gospels. And the slaves, because then you, you, you have someone who's got your back because you're a Christian, they're a Christian, and it's all good. So what happened in the second great awakening is African-Americans, especially here in Kentucky, Kentucky is different from other uh, slaveholding states. People sometimes forget Kentucky was a slaveholding state. Uh, 
But the rules were this. In Kentucky, it was not against the law to teach an enslaved person to read and write. It was not against the law in Kentucky for African-Americans to own property. And it was not against the law in Kentucky for you to hold your children so you could actually create family units. Now, taken by themselves, those sound simple. But reading is very powerful. And not letting people know you can read is even more powerful. <laughs> Because the, the one story of uh, Elijah, uh, Mars, uh, um, what's his name? He listed in the United States colored troops. Elijah, he can read and write. He doesn't tell anybody he can read and write. They sent him to the post office to pick up the mail and the newspapers. So <laughs> before he gets back to the master's house, he detours through the slave quarters and reads the newspaper to all the slaves who were gathered to tell them Union troops are coming. <laughs> and so you have this mass exodus of people who go to camp. Now they know where to go, they know how to get there. And I suspect during his whole life, he's been reading the mail <laughs> and telling folks in the community what's going on. So the power of information is opened here in Kentucky. That, that's another reason I think there were so many escape routes through Kentucky. Because you could actually give direction, you could actually give names, you could actually tell people what to look for, who to help, all these things. Owning a gun. Now, Kentucky slave owners would allow their, their slaves to hold guns because it was a frontier and a slave, uh, Indian attacks were frequent. And so you needed to have your slave able to help you defend. So you could own a gun, but you couldn't own ammunition. I know. Like that would solve the anything because you have me mining saltpeter. Anybody know what you use saltpeter for? I'm working in the mines mining saltpeter, so I don't need your boots. I'll make my own. And so now you have a gun and bullets, right? So just these little subtle things that the, 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 that's why Kentucky has a reputation of being a kinder, gentler form of slavery. Now, when it comes to, by the 1840s and 1850s, people are thinking that Kentucky's too liberal. And you see this push to try and uh, rein that in. But I would say by this time, it's too late. You can't put the horse back in the barn, you know. How much time do we have? Well, I just wanted to uh, to invite everyone. We do have some refreshments out in the lobby to keep this conversation going. I would also invite everyone who does not have a copy of this book already to come down here, buy one, and get it signed. Um, so with that, I want to close our formal Q&A. Um, please stick around and talk with Dr. Turley and one another. Uh, thank you again for this wonderful lecture. Thank you.